Father, we just ask you to let your Holy Spirit continue to minister to your people. Father, complete the work she began during praise and worship. Holy Spirit, we give you full rule and reign over this service right now. Father, have your way. Have your total and complete way right now in the name of Jesus. God said, don't quit selling him short. Some of you sell him, sell him so short. He can do all things. He can really do all things. How many of you this, this week, you have been bombarded on all sides? You not, not even just by the enemy, but there's so many things coming at you at one time. And I said, God, I said, this is, this is unreal, you know. Everything's coming at us at one time. And he said, it's all, all this is coming at you is to distract you from doing the things that God is calling you for to do. It's the enemy sidetracking you. So we have to make sure that, that we don't get sidetracked by the enemy and even though God is fulfilling promises that he's given to you, sometimes with those promises being fulfilled comes extra work, <laughs> right? And make sure that extra work doesn't keep you so preoccupied that you're not fulfilling your job with God. One, one way that works is God does something in your life that he's promised you he's going to do. And along with that comes extra activity. And your mind is going crazy, you know, trying to, to comprehend everything that God is doing. And you're trying to study. This is me, you know. You're trying to study and your mind is just saying about this and saying about that and saying about that. And where you can't really concentrate. So this is a place where you have to really make yourself concentrate. You really have to just say, mind, I am the mind of Christ, and I'm going to concentrate on the things of God. And even though the blessings have occurred, I'm not going to let those blessings sidetrack me. Amen? Because I'm telling you, God's been fulfilling my promises he's been giving me, and along with it comes an awful lot of side distraction. And we're going to have to now be wise and know how to handle everything that comes along with the promises being fulfilled. All right. <laughs> All right, God said, so this is a year of the fullness of his blessings. God wants to bless the body of Christ overly abundantly. He's been, in, he's been wanting to bless us but we have not been receiving the blessings in their fullness. Now, I don't, I, I'm a little bit upset with the body of Christ because the body of Christ is slack and they are not doing the things they're supposed to be doing in this day and hour to combat the things that are, have already come into the world. I was reading a, just a title of something on my computer early this morning. It said, you know, you, there's no jobs and, and you can't go to church and there was something else. And it, coming to church, I thought about the no job thing. You know, they cut down all the, all the jobs. And so what's happening then, the government's paying you to stay at home, giving you more when you stay at home than if you was working. So there you are getting fat and lazy, sitting at home doing nothing and receiving this free money. Don't you understand that's the beginning of communism? They get, you, they get you happy and free, sitting at home doing absolutely nothing, and the government's taking care of you. Next thing you know, all your rights are yanked out from your feet, and the government owns you. Now, are you going to sit by and let that happen? You need to be praying 
and instead of you wanted, wanting to sit at home and do nothing and receive that fat check, where's all this? Do you ever think where's all this money coming from that they're giving to in, into the people's bosoms for sitting at home doing nothing? You, you, you just need to really start thinking about these things. And it's a church's responsibility to be seeking God's face and have an understanding of the times and know exactly what God would have us to do. God's looking at the church to lead the lost. But the church itself is lost and doesn't know where it's going. And therefore, you can't lead anybody anywhere. Some of you in here, God has given you great giftings. What are you doing with the giftings that he's given you? Think about that. Are you really applying them? And right now, you're, you're, you're probably like I am. You're sitting and saying, okay, God, exactly. How do you want me to do this? Which way should I be going? Who should I be reaching out to? Who should I not be reaching out to? Because if you're not careful, you're going to get overburdened and you're not going to get anything done except you're running around in a circle. So God wants his body to get in his presence. And he's been talking about wisdom for quite some time now and discernment. And we need to have both. I forgot what he said in a fresh word this morning. It was about something like the church doesn't do it. How are you going to help the lost? I think that's what it was, the gist of it. And so what are you doing? What are you really doing with your time? You shouldn't have any spare time right now. You shouldn't. You should be so busy with the things of God, you absolutely positively don't have any spare time. You're going to find yourself getting up earlier, going to bed later because God's going to have you busy because he's trying to get this thing in lined up so he can do what he needs to do to bring his glory. And the church is not lining up. I'm surprised. I keep reading where the bigger churches are closing their doors totally and completely for the whole year of 2020. And what that's doing is causing people then not to want to go to church. They're going to get lax in that area. And then a greater falling away is going to occur. So you, who God has placed as a pastor over people, you need to be on your face crying out to God, how do I lead these people? Give me wisdom, Father. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you do not know how to do it. It's going to take God giving you wisdom how to do anything. Are you hearing this? Please don't try to use your own intellect to do anything that God has called you for to do. You have to be moved and directed by the Holy Spirit or you're going to lead people astray. When people hear you're going to church, they're looking up to you really and they're watching how you are growing how you're reacting and how you adjust to things and that's going to determine how they're going to move forward if they see you stumbling and falling at every in every avenue they're not going to want your god they already have that god they want a god who is sturdy and steadfast and strong under all pressures come on and god is right now is on the move he is answering your prayers. He's doing the things you've been asking him to do. I know some of you don't like what the answer to your prayer is, but you're getting your answer to your prayer. And it's putting a lot of pressure on you to grow up and, and be a secure person where other people can run into your tower and they can be secure also. All right? And, you know, I'm hearing God say, woe be unto those pastors who lead my sheep astray. A pastor's job never ends. A pastor's job is hard because you're dealing with a whole lot of pers different personalities. And you can't be like me and say, God, just smack them on the head. <laughs> you can't be like that. You have to be full of grace, long-suffering, and mercy. Amen. And sometimes you have to really search for those three things. 
because you run low on fuel. Amen? But we never, God does not allow us to run low. He said you should always walk in grace, long-suffering, and mercy because that's who he is, right? And we're claiming to be one of his children, right? His offspring, you know? So we should be the very same way. If you watch children and then watch their parents, kids act just like their parents do. So do you really know God? And if you do, are you really one of his children? Or are you a bastard child that just got thrown in there somehow or other? These are things you really need to think about this morning. And I'm hearing God some of you saying some of you have to adjust, adjust the way you think. You still have a carnal mind that won't let you think on godly things. So I want you guys to really think about all of this. This is not anything to do with my sermon, this, my teaching this morning. This is just things that God wants you to know. All right. All right. This is a year of divine completeness, spiritual perfection, and wholeness. This is a year that God is bringing it all together. And you've been crying out, God, bring it together, bring it together. But now he's trying to bring it together, and you're being more scattered. Now, do you want him to bring it all together, or do you not? So you have to make a decision here right now. Do you really want him to bring it together? Do you really want your family saved? Do you really want your husband to act like a godly man in your house? Well, then you're going to have to deal with what God is do doing with them to bring them to where you're asking God to bring them to. And it's always not going to be nice. Things are going to come up, and you're going to say, oh, Lord. Do I really want this? This is what you ask for. And you have to go ahead. You know, some people are hard to clean up. How many can say amen to that? They're just hard to clean up. And you, you think, God, what else can I do? They're, see, when, you, when you're saying that, then you've done all you can do. Then you need to say, God, they're in your hands. Thank God they're in your hands. And I'm going to move on and let you go and complete the works you're trying to do in them. And I'm going to keep my mouth and my hands out of it. And I'm just going to be there as a strong tower when they finally decide, I give up. I give in. And then they start serving God. All right, this is a year of divine completeness, spiritual perfection, and wholeness. And I want us to look at Joseph for, Joseph for a second in Genesis 49, 22. Joseph, it, it, this is what Genesis 20, 49, 22 says about Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers fiercely attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him sorely. In other words, Joseph was a, was a wonderful man of God, but he still had enemies who fought him. All right? And verse 24 says, Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, by the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. In other words, he, he was a mighty man of God. His enemies fought him, and even though his enemies fought him, he did, didn't lose the battles because Jehovah God was with him. Now put yourself in place of this, too. And verse 25 says, By the God of your Father who will help you, by God Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that couches beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. So here he's saying, God is going to bless you in every area of your life. And verse 26 says, The blessings of your Father are mighty beyond the blessings of the eternal mountains, the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was separate from his brothers. God is saying, I want you to be blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. Do you know some people can't stand to be blessed? I have found out in the body of Christ, some people just can't stand to be blessed. And so they curse their very own blessings. All right, so at this given time in Joseph's life, the fullness of blessings is overflowing in his life, all right? What Jacob says of Joseph is history as well as prophecy. Jacob reminds Joseph of the difficult. This is what we just read here. Jacob reminds Joseph of the difficulties and fiery darts of temptations he had formerly struggled through. 
and his faith did not fail. But through his trials, he bore all his burdens with steadfastness and did not do anything unbecoming. Now, they didn't reject God in any way. Jacob was well acquainted with this message because he had already walked out this reality and came out with total victory. This is us. It says that Joseph's faith did not fail. God has been dealing with us about our faith that we have to build it up even higher than what it is right now. Because I'm going to tell you what, guys, what God has shown me, what we're going to go through is going to be rough. And it's only going to be our faith that's going to take us through these rough trails that we're going to have to go on. And if we're a child of God and a leader, we're going to have to go down these rough roads and clear them, clear the path of the demonic forces so others, un the lost, can come forward without any hindrances. We have a job to do. Now, all our strength for resisting temptations and bearing afflictions comes from God. His grace is sufficient. In other words, you can't do anything in your own strength. Joseph became the shepherd of Israel to take care of his father and family, and he also became the stone of Israel, their foundation and strong support. Joseph became the shepherd of Israel to take care of his father and family. Remember when the famine and everything yet? And he also became the stone of Israel, their foundation and strong support. Now, Blessings are promised to Joseph's descendants. Jacob blessed all his sons, but especially Joseph, who was separated from his brethren. Not only separated in Egypt, but possessing great dignity and was more devoted to God. We know that Joseph's brothers were jealous of Joseph. They took him and threw him in a well, sold him to some people, and then Joseph was put into prison. And that's what, why we're saying he was separated from his brethren. All right? All right, this is a real picture of the year 2020, including the Tet symbol that represents a new wineskin or even a fertile womb. God has been telling us we have to become new wineskins in order for him to fill us with new wine. And he's been promised us that we're going to birth many nations. In other words, save many souls. All right? This is all going to happen in this year. If you really want to be church, then you have to get yourself repented and filled up with God and have intimacy with God and been filled up with God so he can send you out there to do the works that needs to be done. We are entering a season of the fullness of God's blessings if we abandon the pains from poor choices in the past. If you won't let go of your past, you can't be blessed. Let them go. Offer them on the altar of grace before God. Let go of your poor choices in the past. Let go of anything you did wrong because you didn't seek God's face. Let it go and move on into your blessings. As you do this, begin to feel God's blessings begin to flow again in your life and watch your relationships begin to be restored. And I'm not talking about the relationship with God. I'm talking about the relationship with people that you've been having problems with. All right? As we do this, we will see our intimacy with our Father deepen day by day. As you can forgive your brother and sister or your kids... <laughs> or your husband or your wife, and you can forgive them and walk in love with them, then your relationship with God really does deepen. When Joseph was reunited with his brothers who had sold him into slavery through, slavery, through famine, God was bringing a conclusion to the way human flesh deals with problems, which is God's grace. Let's read that again. When Joseph was reunited with his brothers who had sold him into slavery, and he was reunited because of a famine, right, that was going on, God was bringing a conclusion to the way human flesh deals with problems. In other words, Joseph showed them God's grace. Joseph, even though he was in prison, God showed him grace upon grace upon grace, and he found favor, even though he was in prison. And so what did Joseph do? He showed his brothers the same grace. 
We want God to show us grace, but we don't want to show anybody else grace. Tell them, Lord. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? If a brother who you really loved, you know, has let you down, you don't push him out of your heart. You pray for him or her. Show them the same grace that God has been showing you. For all you know, what they did to you was out of ignorance. It could be because they are not totally and completely walking in the spirit. And so the part that's not walking in the spirit, the religious part, causes them to do things to you that are not godly. Start showing people grace. This is one of the best messages of God's grace for his own people that could be cited in the entire Bible. You know, Joseph with his brothers. Joseph could have had his brothers executed. You all know that. He could have done that. Yet he displaced overwhelming mercy and became the redeemer for not only his immediate family, but also national Israel. Jacob was very knowledgeable of God's ability to turn tragedy into triumph. Do you ever think about why you go through the junk you go through? Do you ever think it's so that God can show you what he can do? So Jacob was very knowledgeable of God's ability to turn tragedy into trump, triumph. How many? I know for one thing, I know what God can do. I know how he can turn tragedy into triumph. I really do. And I hope each one of you in here understand the different things that you've gone through is so God's trying to show you what a powerful God he really is. All right, demonstrating that if we will purpose to keep our eyes on God in the process, then God will allow the stones in our past to become the very gates of God. And I'm going to read a scripture to cover that in a minute. This year, allow your stones in your path to become your Bethel of blessings. In other, other words, whatever the enemy has thrown in front of you to try to stop you, praise God for it and let it be a blessing instead of a curse. All right, let's read Genesis 28, start at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he, be, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. I literally saw that ladder. It does exist. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you, you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring." And what was Jacob doing? He was laying on the ground on a stone. And God said, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The, la the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. To, see that? And to your offspring. God just doesn't want to bless you. He wants to bless your entire family. But some of you say, well, they don't need to be blessed. <laughs> Cut the blessing off right here, God. Don't let it go any further. No, he wants to. See, that's not right. That's not grace. All right, 14 says, Your offering shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. All the families in the earth will be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. Now, this is God speaking to Jacob. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then he tells you, so what does he tell Jacob? I will never leave you until I accomplish what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. This is where all the blind church is. <laughs> Surely the Lord is in this place, and nobody knows it. <laughs> Amen. Come on. And Jacob was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And where was he at? Laying on the ground on a stone.
He knew his God. You all don't know your God. Because you get all upset when trials and tribulations come your way. Now, Jacob went on to pay a great price for the valuable lessons of a pathway from trick trickster to triumph. Some of you are learning valuable lessons as you're going. Please learn them quickly because you'll keep going around that mountain over and over again until you learn them. Remember, God told me you can go around that mountain as long as you want to. And when you're ready to get quit going around the mountain, I'll be here for you. In other words, I was trying to do it myself, and God wanted to do it for me. So how many of you in here this morning are trying to do things in your own steam, and God's saying, let me do it, and you go on to do what I'm calling you for to do? Joseph was just one such reminder, yet in the end, God turned all things around to bring us the message that this year offers. This year is a birth of the church's turnaround. Judy Jacobs, I think it is, just wrote an article about that. I read it this morning. This is, a, and she said, this is year of the turnaround in the church. She has a song out by that too. Now, Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. Favorite son. Joseph is a Hebrew spelling for Joseph, and means he increases or enlarges or becomes more full. Just as this time of revelation came to light to Joseph that his brothers lied to their father, you know, he didn't know that he had lied to his father, it also lets us know that in 2020 we must let go of any sinful patterns of our past. Joseph had to just forget what they did. But it, it, when I said about him being a trickster, at first he tricked them. He, he wasn't happy with them. But then he got God's grace going and then he blessed them. Some of us have been like that. We haven't been showing God's grace. So after this morning, what you show God's grace and forgive them for whatever they've done. This will bring the necessary healing of old sinful ways to a required end. In other words, if you'll just let go of all that junk, you're going to be healed. How many of you, let's just say two months ago, let's say, all of a sudden you start thinking of all these terrible things somebody has done to you. It just sort of overwhelmed you. I don't know if you've, I did that. In other words, it's coming from. And the enemy wanted me to hold ought against a dead person for the things they did that I forgot they did. But he was trying to trick me and trying to get me out of God's will by bringing all that junk back to my memory. And it was through another person. You remember, they did this, this. No, I hadn't, I hadn't even remembered that. But see, they would bring that to, the devil was using them to bring that to my remembrance so I would stew in that. Well, I didn't stew in that. I said, I, I'm, I just don't even care about it. And I'm, I'm going to continue to move on. And this is what you have to do. You have to forget what people did to you. I know it hurt. And I know because you were ignorant, you, you, you fed into the thing too, and it destroyed you in some areas of your life. But see, you were just as bad as a person that was doing it. So you have to let go of it and move on. All right, I said, it also lets us know that in 2020, we must let go of any sinful patterns of our past, and this will bring the necessary healing of old sinful ways to a required end because God will now enlarge our blessings into their fullness. We are in a season of both Cronus and Kairos times. It is time for our Cronus times to become a season of fullness. If you don't let go of them, you're not going to enter into this fullness of time that God has for us right now. We must understand what kind of lifestyle God desires for us and not give in to human efforts or busyness. 2020 will be a year to end the strife of past broken relationships and once again move forward with your obedience to God in birthing your destiny. I'm telling you guys, as long as you hold on to those past hurts, you're never going to fulfill your destiny in God. You're just not going to. You're just not. You need to really get this in your spirit. Some people sit in church, amen, 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 but then to go home and you know what they did to me? You, you, you didn't, amen didn't help you. You really have to, deter, you have to determine, I'm not going to think about that ever again, period. It's done and so forth. I can't change it. 
I didn't change it when it happened. I can't change it today. And God has it, and I'm never going to think about it again. And I know, I'm hearing God say, this is very frustrating times. Very frustrating times. And we have to understand, and this is what he's saying, we have to understand the enemy is bringing old mindsets back, trying to get you to think of the things that you said you're never going to think of again. All right. All right, I said 2020 will be a year to end the strife of past broken relationships and once again move forward with your obedience to God and birthing your destiny. We cannot move forward without some very important conclusion to past mistakes. In other words, it's uh, somebody didn't do it to you. You made mistakes. This will enable us to walk in the gratitude of grace from our Father as opposed to wandering in the wilderness of once forever. You know, I have found out that what you need is you need somebody around you who you can be open and honest with. That you can go to them and share the deepest, ugliest thing in your heart. And they're not going to condemn you for it, but they're going to pray for you. And I've just gone through some times like that just recently. And I have a group of people that I can talk to, and they don't hate me. But they pray and they seek God's face to see how to set me free from the junk that's come my way. See, as long as you think that you have to keep everything bottled up, you don't want anybody to know that you have bad thoughts too, you're going to stay in bondage. But when you, but when you can be open and honest and say, this is where I'm at. I've cried out to God here in the last couple months of God, I'm not even fit to be a pastor with what's going through my heart right now. But the people I called and <clears throat> shared my heart with, they prayed, and God brought me through it. Come on, you are not God. Your heart is not always pure. It is not. Now, if, you're, if you are like that, then you go ahead and go into heaven because there's no place for you down here. Amen. Do you know why a lot of people don't get really saved in churches? Because the pastor makes them believe that the pastor is immovable, that they no, no way can they ever sin, and they never tell the truth. And the people are trying to live up to what the, the lifestyle they think the pastor has, and they can't make it, so they leave. You're going to have to be open and honest. You're going to have to bear your heart. And whenever you're ministering to the lost world, you're going to have to say, you know, they're thinking you're God, you know. But you're going to say, you look, this is what I did. This is where I was at, and, and this is what God did for me, and he washed me clean, and here I am today. This is what's going to win the lost, is honesty. The truth of who you were and the truth of who you are right now today. And you just can't say that's who you are now today. You have to be living that example so that others can follow it. The spirit of travail is dropping on everyone who positions themselves for desperation to birth their prophetic destiny now. I wrote that because all I've been doing lately is crying. I just crying, crying, crying. I said, God help me. Just crying. And God has helped me, <clears throat> excuse me, God is helping me through each and every day. God, I need your strength today. Before you even get out of this bed, I need your strength so I can live out this day. Come on. The devil is relentless. And he's going to keep trying to take you out until the day you go home to be with your Father in heaven. And if you don't think that that's not true, then you're, you're already lost. That's how you can tell how close you walk to God is how hard the devil fights you. If he doesn't fight you, that means you're no threat to him. No threat at all. So he just passes you by and, and he goes and fights the ones that can really tear down his kingdom. All right? Grace is sufficient for all of our needs. And 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And this is Paul speaking. And what does Paul say? My God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, when you're weak, that's when you really cry out to God. And that's when God really comes on the scene in a strong way. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2020 is the time the body of Christ is being encouraged by God to forget the past. And you know, he's been dealing with that about with us. Embrace your fullness of blessings and take that message to a very hurting world. 2020 is a year of evangelistic harvest. The year 2020 became the beginning of one of the most unprecedented times of harvest this nation and the world will ever experience. God has been preparing us for this reaping. Have you been allowing God to prepare you to be a harvester? We need to have our visions of a move of God raised higher. Take time to follow the Lord's dr drawing you into a deep hunger for intimacy with him and the sheep of his pastor. In other words, you want God to draw you into a deep intimacy with him along with the rest of the church. Just not yourself. Don't be selfish. He cares for every one of his creation. He made us to glorify him in all the earth. 2020 will be a year that is initiated in many exciting ways. Begin to thank the Lord for all his love and grace and care that he gave us more than we could ever deserve. All right, I'm going to just share a testimony here. Uh, I was, I've really been trying to get my household to live a godly life, and, and the more I try that, the more they don't like me. And I was laying in bed last night saying my prayers, and I started crying, and I said, you know, God, just take me on home. The more I try to live holy, the more they don't like me. And Gabriel said, I just heard you teach <laughs> that if you're going to live for God, you're going to not be loved or, and you're going to be persecuted. <laughs> so listen to what the little boy said. And I said, you're right. He, he does, he reminds me of different things. But um, it, you need to be around to remind you. Yeah, so why was I crying? Because somebody I love dearly and you know, I'm trying to get him turned around doesn't like me right now. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt your heart when your kids turn against you, when your parents turn against you, whoever it is. But like Gabriel said, you have, you have no right to complain because you taught it. <laughs> you got to live what you teach. What did God say? If, you can't, if you're not living what you teach, you don't stand behind this pulpit and teach something you're not living. Amen. 2020 will be a year for praise and thanksgiving. In Psalms 100, verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. That's what you all did this morning. I thought it was exciting. In 1 Chronicles 16, King David appointed Levites to lead in prayer, thanksgiving, and praise. At the heart of this chapter is thanksgiving. Beginning in verse 7, David recited his own psalm of thanks to the Lord. The verses following reveal a beautiful song of gratitude to God. Uh, uh, First Chronicles 16, you ought to read it, and he tells how he appointed each person to do a certain thing so they could really praise the Lord in a proper way. True worship of God issues forth from grateful hearts. Do you ever think that that's why people don't really worship God in the house of God the way they ought is because they don't have a grateful heart for what God has done for them? Think about that. I did when I wrote that down. And after I read that chapter, you come in here, you're upset with God, and so why should you sing to him? Why are you upset with him? You ought to be upset with the devil because he's the one that's making you think that way. Exchange a spirit of bitterness for a spirit of thanksgiving. A feeling such as a feeling such as bitterness, envy, hostility, and pride disqualifies anyone from genuine worship. You hear that? A feeling such as bitterness, envy, hostility, and pride disqualifies anyone from genuine worship. When Sister Mary came up here and started dancing, that was the Holy Spirit that made her jump up there and up there and dance like that. 
and you could just feel the anointing just flowing. So she didn't have any of these qualities in her this morning, or she couldn't, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have used her to do that. And what the Holy Spirit was trying to do, he said, I wished everybody would allow me to touch them like this, and they would all dance before me. Are you listening? So what's in your heart? Why can't God touch you and, and move you to dance like that? Think about this, you pastors, you leaders of any type. You children are set in the house of God that should be out there witnessing to the world. What's in your heart? All right, Thanksgiving opens up the door of the heart toward God in such a way that the individual is freed for true worship of God. Thanksgiving. You know, I don't care if it's the worst thing in the world. We need to thank God for it. We just need to thank God for it. I got a phone call saying my grandson was in an act car accident, and I immediately started thanking God. I said, thank you, God, for all the promises you put over his life. Thank you, God, you said you would never, never leave him nor forsake him. I just started thanking him. I just started praising him. I didn't say, oh, my God, what's going on? Is he dead or what? I just, for some reason or other, just started thanking God. That isn't the first thing that comes in our heart, though, is it? It isn't. We get all upset and we get, get into our flesh and do dumb things. All right, everywhere in Scripture, this spirit of thanksgiving is revealed as vital to our worship experience. King David had a lifestyle of one trial after another. If you read his, his history, that's what it is. King David had a lifestyle of one trial after another. That could have been his ending at any moment if he had ever given in to defeat. Some of you have given in to defeat. You need to start thanking God at every turn. However, David had the same faithfulness that Joseph and Jacob possessed. They allowed themselves no room for destruction. Come on. You allow room for destruction, and that's why some of you are not lifted up right here this morning because you're not walking in the fullness of what God wants you to walk in, and therefore the enemy has his foot in the door, and he can tear you down anytime he so desires. Praise and worship before an almighty God became not only a healing salve to their wearied souls, but also a weapon of praise against the wiles of the devil. And we're talking about Joseph, Jacob, and David, and of course everybody else in the Bible. Likewise, we need to incorporate praise as a lethal weapon in our spiritual arsenal and be like David and then have a spirit of thanksgiving for saving him from his enemies. And what does Psalm 30 verse 1 say? This is David speaking. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought up my soul from Shul. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. See that? Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. This is David speaking, and this should be you speaking. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. He didn't pick up a cell phone. He cried to the Lord, okay? What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me, O Lord. Be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. That Why did he do that? That my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you. How long? Forever. Forever to some of you means one second after another. <laughs> one second you're going to praise him. Next second you're going to curse him. Or say, God, where are you at? He's right where he's always been. Right there, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
our faith has been sorely tested in every area, has it not? We need to understand that the trying of our faith is what makes Christians stronger. Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, see that? But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Now is the time to begin drawing even deeper into the heart of our Father and to thank him for all he has done for a people who deserve none of his goodness. We don't deserve any of his goodness, but he gives it to us anyhow. 2020 is a year to press into and beyond the fullness of blessings for you and your family. Let's read 1 Chronicles 17 and put your name where David's name appears. 1 Chronicles 17, verse 16. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me thus far? And this was a small thing in thy eyes, O God. Thou hast also spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and hast shown me future generations, O Lord God. And what more can David say to thee for honoring thy servant? For thou knowest thy servant. You know, David said, what can I say for your honoring me, God? And you know me. He, he knows his stupidity and he knows his, his high points, right? David says, For thy servant's sake, O Lord, and according to thine own heart, thou hast wrought all this greatness in making known all these great things. There is none like thee, O Lord, and there is no God besides thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. What other nation on earth is like thy people, Israel, whom God went to redeem by who whom God went to redeem to be his people? making for thyself a name for great and terrible things in driving out nations before thy people whom thou didst redeem from Egypt. You know, he's driving, he's, how many enemies has he driven out of your life? Come on now. You serve a great and a mighty God. How many times has he kept you safe when you should have died? How many times have you died and he's brought you back to life? I've, you know, I've witnessed all these things in my own life. I serve a great and a powerful God. Come on. In verse 22, David said, that, And thou didst make thy people Israel to be thy people forever, and thou, O Lord, didst become their God. And now, O Lord, let the word which you hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house be established forever, and do as thou hast spoken. David said, God, what you've spoken over my house, let it happen. Why don't you people do that? God, what you've spoken over my life and over my house, let it happen. In verse 24, and thy name will be established and magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God, and the house of thy servant David will be established before thee. For thou, my God, hast revealed to thy servant that thou wilt build a house for him. Therefore, thy servant has found courage to pray before thee. And now, O Lord, thou art God, and thou hast promised this good thing to thy servant. Now, therefore, may it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For what thou, O Lord, hast blessed is blessed. How long? Forever. God does not take his favor or his, or his blessings from your life. The enemy does. The enemy comes and he speaks things in your mind, and you believe the dumb enemy instead of God. Do not believe another word that the enemy speaks into your spirit, man. You tell him no more room for him. You make him leave. Some of you sitting here this morning, you're still not where you should be with God, and you don't have much more time to get it together, and you can't blame God when, you, when he passes you by, and he takes your mantle and gives it to somebody else. You won't be able to say, God, you didn't give me a chance because God's given you more chances than you deserve. How long have you sat in the house of God and still messed up? You have a Bible. You have knees. <laughs> you can bow on your knees and you can cry out to your God, the Father in heaven. You can repent. You should be repenting to him. You have to, you know, this is my temple, and I have to take care of my temple, right? Somebody else is not going to take care of my temple. You might, be able to, you might pray for me, and you do, but I have to do a works also. 
I just can't sit and say, well, I'm going to have so-and-so pray for me and everything's going to be fine. No, I have a work to do too. I have to make sure that the enemy goes and stays gone. I have to make sure that I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind over and over and over again. I have to make sure I, have, I do everything I have to do in order to stay where God wants me to be. And if you're a leader, you're going to be fought more than just somebody sitting in the church. And if you're not yet a leader and you're being fought, but well, God is preparing you for, for, to be a leader. So don't sit around and complain. Sit around and thank God that he thinks that you're so wonderful that he's allowing you to be tested and tried to the very core of your being so that you can be the leader that he's calling you forth to be. I'm going to tell you right now, as long as you walk the face of this earth, and if you're really a true child of God, you're going to be fought. That's just, that's where it's at. Read the word. That's where it's at. So quit thinking that the devil's going to leave you alone because he is not. He is not. Fight the good fight of faith. Isn't that what the word says? You know, I often think about everybody wants God just to get, do everything, you know, get you healed and do whatever. But if you think about Paul, they were in prison most of the time praising God, and they, that's where he wrote the letters to the different churches, in prison, in stocks, and, and being whipped. And they say the deepest part of the prison is where the sore runs through the town. So here he was sitting in, in the sore where all the poop was, and he was praising God. You guys can't even praise God, and you sit in your little mansions here, you know, up here, and everything's just clean and neat and tidy. You can't praise God because you're too busy complaining. Don't you feel ashamed of yourself? I hope I shamed you. I hope you're ashamed of the fact that you, instead of you praising God, you're complaining. And God said, you who you complain more than you praise, he really wants to touch you this morning so that you will no longer complain, but you will become a praiser of the Father. And your praise will be so great and powerful that it will pour over into other people. So if you're going to be honest, this is the altar call. If you're a complainer, God wants you to come forth, and he wants to touch you where you won't complain again, and he's going to give you the power and the authority that you won't complain, but you'll praise him even in your deepest pit.